Thank you all so much for joining us today for our webinar, Financial Planning for Beginners. My name is Kelly Blount, and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead. Thanks to technology, we're excited to be able to continue to connect with you on such a great topic and wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of your home, work, or wherever you may be today. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Eric Waldron to introduce himself and take us through today's topic. <clears throat> thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. I uh, appreciate you guys joining us this afternoon for today's webinar on financial planning. Uh, a quick introduction, though, before we get started. Uh, my name is Eric Waldron. As Kelly mentioned, I'm one of the advisors with uh, GE Credit Union. Uh, I've been in the uh, financial services industry for nearly 30 years, with uh, my last nine being here at the credit union. Uh, my job uh, is simple, is to help our membership out with retirement planning, uh, investments, risk management. Some of the areas that I cover range from investment uh, and al asset allocation to retirement income strategies, uh, social security planning, risk management focusing on life and long-term care, as well as Medicare planning. Uh, and then kind of touching on today's uh, topic of financial planning uh, with comprehensive software that we use with our uh, membership uh, that I will touch on later in this uh, in this webinar. So with that, let's get started. Uh, you know, in this presentation, we're going to take a look at some general planning concerns. Uh, while there's no such thing as one size fits all uh, in a financial plan, this overview should at least assist you and get you thinking about your own needs and, and plans uh, for your retirement. So grounds to cover. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of ground here, uh, but even with an overview, uh, the topics that we're gonna touch on, we'll be talking about setting goals. Uh, this is, uh, doing so is really the first step toward developing any financial plan. Again, when we uh, touch on this software, that, hey, it's a goals-based software. What do we wanna do in retirement? Uh, then we're gonna, discuss constructing a budget, right, for those basic living expenses. Uh, these are going to be happening to you every month for 12 months a year for possibly 30 plus years in retirement, making sure we uh, get those numbers uh, somewhat uh, correct and near a real figure. We're going to create an emergency fund. Uh, obviously, a lot of you have probably heard of this term before. It's, you know, three to six months is the, is the typical a uh, guideline uh, of having uh, three to six months of basic living expenses. We'll touch on insurance with life and long-term care. Uh, in many cases, you're gonna need to incorporate credit into your plan. So we'll discuss some of the basic fundamentals of credit. Uh, we'll talk about some basic uh, investment concepts and then understanding pre or post tax or after tax along with deferral uh, that can help pursue your goals uh, and, and meet everything that uh, you desire. Uh, we'll talk about uh, savings for college, planning for your retirement, um, again, with that comprehensive plan, 401k planning, uh, Roth, traditional IRA planning. And then last but certainly not least, we'll take a look at the basics of estate planning uh, and how important that is uh, with wills and, and, and things of that nature, healthcare plans, power of attorney. So, uh, going into setting uh, our goals. So, you know, one of the first steps in, in a financial plan is setting those goals. Uh, when you set these goals, they're going to define what you want to do uh, in your retirement, in your future. Some of these goals may be things that you want to do in the not so distant future, like pay off a credit card or buy a car. Other goals may be more distant, like building a new vacation home uh, or starting your own business, pay for a grandchild's college education or help fund it. And possibly retire early. One of the one of the things that uh, we're seeing a lot in today's movement, especially post COVID, is this acronym FIRE: Financial Independent Retire Early. Uh, so possibly, hey, can we can we meet these goals with our incomes, with our assets, uh, by retiring early? So your goals are going to be the foundation of your plan because you need to know what you want to accomplish before you can begin investing or saving. And, you know, you're going to prioritize these goals, want, excuse me, needs, wants, wishes, uh, and then develop your uh, investment strategy, uh, you know, that can turn these goals into reality down the road. So, and again, Money Guide Pro, which we're going to we're touch on, it's a goals-based planning software, taking into consideration all these incomes and, 
and, and goals and assets that you have. So how smart are your goals? You know, making your goals as concrete as possible uh, will help you uh, focus on what's really important. Basically, a defined goal is a lot easier to visualize, easier to stick with. So we use this acronym, or acronym SMART, um, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. So first, a goal that's specific, it's one that's clearly defined in detail. Uh, you know what you want to accomplish so i want to say for my child's college education is not that specific but i want to save the cost of four years at ohio state by the time my daughter turns 17 is clearly defined measurable with a measurable goal you should be able to track your progress and clearly know when you reached it so an example here would be i want to retire early that's not a measurable goal but i want to retire by my 55th birthday is a goal that has defined endpoint and is measurable. Uh, an attainable goal is a realistic and reachable goal, right? Goals can be challenging, uh, but you gotta have a fair chance at achieving them. So, you know, saving $1 million in five years is probably not an attainable goal for many people, but having $1 million in my retirement savings by the time I retire or in 30 years may be a very attainable goal. Um, a relevant goal is one that makes sense to you, you know, one that reflects your needs, uh, your values, goals that are relevant, or goals that you'll be excited about uh, that are going to be important to you. I want to save $25,000 for a down payment so I can own my own home, right? That's an example of a goal that's going to be relevant to you and where you are in your, in your journey. Uh, you might be able to set a time frame or a deadline for reaching your goal. I want to pay off my credit card debt by the end of next year. That would be an example of a timely goal that is has a clear uh, deadline. So writing these down, prioritizing these goals, uh, having a correct budget, these are all um, essential first steps toward putting this plan together uh, and putting a plan into action. So the first part of putting any financial plan into action requires control of your money, right? Cash flow. Uh, that's what part of a budget is all about. So the budget tracks your income and expenses, very simple, in inflow versus outflow. Um, and helps you direct how these assets move and the way you want them to move and what they're going to move towards. So to construct a budget, you're going to first account for all your income. You know, this is going to include paychecks, pension, if, you, if you're still working or part-time, pensions, right? If you're lucky enough to have a pension, maybe you have some rental property and have some rental income. Um, you know, government benefits such as Social Security, uh, interest from your investments such as a, a CD, or uh, maybe a dividend paying stock, uh, again, which would also fall under investment income. And then from that, you're gonna need to subtract your expenses. So expenses can be really broken down into two simple categories, those that are fixed, ones that you can pretty much count on happening every month, um, and those that are discretionary. Um, and it's gonna be very difficult maybe to look at one month and say, hey, this is a specific number that I'm gonna spend every month because of those discretionary items. So what you're gonna to wanna to look at is, you know, maybe doing this for three to six months because these are the most important, or this is the most important part of the financial plan, is making sure you have a pretty good idea of what is gonna be consistently coming every month, again, for 12 months, for 30 to 35 years over your retirement. Um, and it's when I sit down with a lot of our members and do this financial planning, this is the this is the most common eye opener for them uh, in terms of how much it can affect the success of a plan. So again, you know, probably not a one month exercise, but maybe over three to six months, knowing what those uh, uh, monthly numbers look like. And hopefully, at the end, you, like you see I here on your screen, you have a surplus. A lot of times you don't, though, right? You're going to have a deficit. That's where those retirement savings come in, and we'll talk about that. So before we get to that, we're going to talk about an emergency fund, um, you know, money that's readily, readily available to meet those unexpected what ifs in life that come around, right? They happen often. I um, mean, it's really, um, you know, a foundation for any successful plan um, without money to fall back on when these, uh, you know, unexpected things pop up, you may be forced to tap savings that you're, you're marking for retirement um, or, or another goal, right? Like uh, saving for college. Also, they might involve penalties, right? If you come out of some of those retirement uh, savings accounts early, they could, uh, you know, have a 10% penalty attached to them. 
Uh, and then, how, you know, how much should you have in your emergency fund? So again, a popular rule of thumb is that you should have an emergency fund that is equal to three to six months of your living expenses. Um, but this is going to depend on many factors, like how stable is your income? Is your industry hiring or is it laying off people? Are you in a growing field, right? Uh, do you have adequate health and disability insurance in place already? So all of these things are going to be individual and uh, specific to you based on what maybe that number uh, should look like for an emergency fund. Um, where you keep your emergency fund, though, is also important. Uh, obviously, in a jar, backyard, under the mattress, not a great idea, but most likely an account that is readily, uh, or readily, <laughs> readily available within two to three days, um, but is also earning an interest. Now, right, granted, I understand where we are today in interest rates, and there's not much paying interest, but uh, uh, obviously, what, what we're getting at is something that is going to be liquid within a couple days uh, to meet those what ifs that might pop up, but it still have a better return than nothing, you know, um, in that jar that we talked about. So moving on, we're going to talk about risk management. You know, another port, important part of financial planning is identifying and managing potential risks uh, that can impact your finances. So the value of insurance, uh, you know, it's a cost-effective way to mitigate or share uh, those costs uh, uh, and various risks, you know, common types, as you can see here up on the screen, health insurance, you know, most of us, uh, you know, and most employers offer health insurance. Most of us are, you know, seeing increasing uh, costs in that field, especially with the uh, increasing costs of, of medical care. It's, it's something that uh, increases at a much higher rate than regular inflation. Hence, that's why we're seeing it. And what we're seeing also is obviously, the you know, basically the dominance of high deductible plans, you know, uh, high deductible high healthcare plans is where most of 80 or 90% of people are at. Um, but you still need to have that health insurance, right? Auto insurance, protect the car, liability and property, uh, you know, life insurance, you're going to look to protect loved ones, uh, depending if you have children where you are. Uh, usually that number looks like eight to 10, maybe 12 times your uh, annual income, uh, again, depending on where you are in your life and your life stage. Uh, we're going to talk about property insurance, which is going to be against damage and theft. Liability insurance, this would be for other what ifs that are mentioned already. This is commonly known as an umbrella insurance. Probably heard of that before. Uh, disability insurance, something happens and, you know, you might be out of work for six months. Do I have that insurance to, you know, maintain my lifestyle to pay those basic living expenses. And then long-term care insurance. A lot of people think Medicare uh, covers long-term care. It does not. Uh, long-term care insurance is, you know, a nursing home, assisted living, in-home care. Uh, you know, what we're seeing with an aging population is a lot more of these cases and how it can be straining on a family, uh, not only financially, but uh, emotionally. So having this uh, long-term care insurance in place, uh, or at least discuss it to see if it's practical for, practical for your particular plan, uh, would be important. So using uh, credit, the three C's of credit, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, as you can see there, says it best. Remember that credit is money. So word of caution, don't rely on credit to cover normal living expenses unless you have to. Uh, you know, you could be heading down a, a path that could lead to financial disaster, especially with interest rates rising in, in all facets of life right now. Um, you know, how do creditors decide to grant credit? Well, it's going to depend on how you meet these three C's. So they're going to want to know if you have the capacity to repay uh, that credit that they grant you. They'll want to know about your income and your expenses. Um, you know, once the creditor determines, you know, your capacity to repay, uh, they're going to talk about your character. To measure this, they'll look at factors that measure your stability. You know, how long have you had this, you know, the same job, lived in the same place? Uh, and if you've and if you've used credit before, I also want to look at your re repayment history, right? Do you pay your bills on time? Um, and then particularly for loans of larger amounts, like a car or a home, a creditor is going to want to see some collateral, right? Collateral is tangible property that secures the credit extended to you to buy it. Um, if you default, the creditor can you know legally be entitled to take possession of that property uh, as a form of compensation. So creditors determine your credit worthiness primarily by examining three documents. The credit application that you fill out uh, with a potential lender, 
Uh, it's going to be a lot of personal information. I'll ask you about income and sources, other income sources, as well as uh, recurring expenses and debts that you might have. Then it, they'll also look at a credit report that will give the lender uh, a lot of information about your history of payments, uh, how much debt you have, and then you get a credit score. And that's just a statistical um, you know, formula that analyzes information on your credit report and compares you to others. It profiles against you against other people in your same situation uh, and you know pops out a three digit number uh, that predicts your you know that your level of future credit risk so that's kind of how credit is you know be careful with credit obviously again credit is money um, but some people uh, you know are going to have to probably access at some point you know look at a lot of those low uh, low to no uh, interest rate well, I guess that it would be uh, welcome rates, you know, 12 to 18 months, um, and, and possibly, you know, be able to move them around between different companies to keep that interest rate low. So um, debt. So we're going to talk about debt here. So debt may be divided into two basic types, secured and unsecured. You know, eventually you might have both. Uh, so uh, secured debt, again, is backed up by a lien of on collateral. Examples are going to include the house and that home equity loan or a car loan. Unsecured debt does not have a place to lien uh, on any of your real or personal property to secure it. So think of this being personal installment loans, student loans, and most credit card accounts. That would be unsecured. Um, when you're thinking about taking on debt, there are three important considerations. Uh, the amount, right, will obviously have a big impact on the size of the payment. Uh, no matter what the term, uh, you have to repay it or the interest rate you, you're charged, right? So you'll want to consider, hey, within a review of your budget, does this amount fit in my budget? Um, so when looking at an installment loan, the term of the loan is the length. Uh, generally, larger loans have longer terms. Think about a 30-year mortgage on a home, maybe an 84-month on a car. Uh, you know, These are going to have longer-term implications on your credit score, on all these things, but results in higher total interest payments over the life of the loan. So does that fit into your budget? And then interest rate, uh, your charge on a debt also affects the total interest you know, rate you're going to pay or the premium you're going to pay each month. And obviously, you've seen that happen in, in today's mortgage rates. You know, just a year ago, I was telling this story to a, a member, I don't know, a couple weeks ago that in March of last year, I refied my house at two and a quarter percent on a 15-year mortgage. Well, hell, that is now up over five, five and a quarter percent. It's a major, major factor in what that premium payment looks like. So making sure you get the best, uh, make sure you, you, you look into it. Are they adjustable? Are they fixed? Knowing all the ins and outs of that rate. So um, moving on to investing, right? Let's talk about investing and potential for accumulating wealth. This is going to be through your working years, what we call your accumulation phase. Uh, you know, do you associate it with speculating or gamble? You know, gambling. Uh, do you think of it as betting on the market or trying to time the market in order to make a quick profit, or do you think of it as a long-term methodical approach? And what it is, it's a little bit of each, but done properly. You know, investing is a carefully planned approach to managing your money uh, and accumulating these funds to meet these retirement goals you're going to have. Uh, and planning, plain and simple is about two things. It's about discipline and patience and staying the course. What we don't want, and we'll, we'll touch on this again or go, here in a few slides, is, is about that risk tolerance. You know, Honoring your risk tolerance, but staying, being able to stay the course without making uh, you know, panic decisions. What we have found out through behavioral uh, science is you know, the market and money and people with money are driven on two, two emotions, fear and greed. And unfortunately, we have the wrong emotion at the wrong time with these with these uh, fear with with fear and greed. Um, but if you have that portfolio set up right, you have a financial plan in place. This will help alleviate it, right? And that's what you want to do is be able to not make those those decisions at wrong times. So jumping right into the risk tolerance slide here. So understanding the you know the risk reward trade off. So when it comes to investing, there's a simple relationship between risk and return. Uh, the, return, the potential for uh, return increases with the level of risk, right? Or stated another way, less risk an investment has, the lower potential return. 
Um, and so the investment plan that's right for you depends on your level of comfort with risk, what is known as your tolerance, your personal risk tolerance. You can't completely avoid risk, especially now when, you know, uh, interest is paying less than 2% on most accounts. Um, but it's possible to manage that risk. And what I call this is the sleep test. Hey, we don't want something that is just keeping you up at night and you're not able to, you know, you're thinking about the market, you're watching the market every day. We want to be able to find this balance, right, of knowing what your risk tolerance is. And the two key questions are, you know, how comfortable are you personally with risk? It's subjective. Everybody's going to be different. Um, and it depends on many factors. You know, it depends, again, life stage. What are your particular goals? Maybe you have a simple set of goals and don't need to take as many or as much risk. Um, it's your personality and your experience. If you've been burned in the past and have had bad experiences. So, uh, some investor, investors are very comfortable with a high degree of risk, while others can't tolerate much at all. But most people should and do fall somewhere uh, right in the middle there. And the second question is, how well is your investment plan set up to handle potential losses? Again, this is the resilient, resiliency of your plan, making sure that the plan is set up to your particular um, tolerance with a proper asset allocation, right? Being properly invested so you can stay the course um, and not, again, make those bad decisions at the wrong time or survive a major setback, setback that could make you have to possibly work longer or not meet certain goals that you have planned for. So several key terms of investing. I'll keep this short and simple. Growth, income, and stability. So think about growth, anything that increases in market value, stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, real estate, uh, income is going to be payments of interest or dividends. Think of annuities, uh, bond interest, or stocks that pay a dividend, right? These things generate income. And then you have stability, which we know is preservation of uh, principal or original investment, things like CDs, money markets, fixed annuities. But it's important to have a balance of these three areas or these three terms based on your personal risk tolerances. So uh, income tax considerations, uh, you know, pre-tax dollars, deductions are made uh, from your paycheck before the taxes are calculated. So, you know, say somebody's in the 22% tax bracket, uh, something that costs $100, if it's going out before, uh, deduct, you know, before taxes, it really is only costing $78, right? What costs 100 only costs 78 if it goes before taxes. So getting Things that, uh, you know, would be an example of that would be health or dependent care, like an FSA or an HSA. Uh, you know, this, these will be lower out-of-pocket expenses ultimately for you because it happens before taxes. Transportation costs, if, you know, people get transportation with bus passes and things like that. Um, retirement plans, contributions like your typical 401 or 403B. Uh, and then you have tax-deferred growth, right? So this is, you know, your money stays in, your interest earns interest. Um, you know, no taxes are due until it hits your pocket. Uh, you know, in certain cases, qualified distributions are tax-free, though, like a, a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. Um, a 529 would be tax-free as well if it's used for educational expenses. Um, but remember also with tax deferred growth, penalty tax applies in some situations, such as early withdrawals or what we call non-qualified distributions, uh, typically before 59 and a half. So uh, a good slide re regarding the value of tax deferral, of taxable versus uh, tax deferred growth. If you just take $10,000 and invest it in year one, and this is a 30-year look at your money, you get the 6% annual growth rate, a moderate growth rate portfolio, a tax rate of 24%. And you can see after 30 years, if you're not in a tax deferred account, your 10 grand grows to 38,104. If you are in a tax deferred, it's 57,435, but even after taxes, when it does hit your pocket, it's, it's substantially higher by five, uh, $5,600, $5,500. That's a big deal. That's almost you know 15% uh, higher just by having tax deferred growth. So again, knowing the importance and the value of tax deferral and getting that money sheltered if possible, again, you can do this through uh, Roths and, and traditional IRAs and 401s and 403s. Uh, you can do it through certain non-qualified annuities that give you tax deferral. 
So any of these uh, are options to try to get that money and, and keep that money in there and have that those earnings compound and that interest earn interest for you. So moving on, um, you know we're going to talk about saving for college uh, for college through 529 plans. Um, you know, individual account, pre-established portfolios, um, returns that are not guaranteed. So this is, you know, typically these are going to be mutual funds. Um, you know, funds can be used towards accredited college or uh, any K through two program as well. Um, student loan repayment as well. Um, then you have prepaid tuition. So this is prepay uh, tuition in today's cost for when your child is actually going to receive the education. So it's a guaranteed return and pays a portion of that tuition, but those plans are typically limited to a, um, a certain amount of money that is regulated by your state, um, and it usually can only go to in-state public colleges. So again, for that 529, you know, tax deferred growth, and then obviously tax-free earnings. Um, if they are not used for educational purposes, they will be subject to not only an income tax, like a withdrawal from an IRA, but also a penalty. Uh, I also mentioned that these are transferable to other uh, immediate family members. Um, if one child doesn't use it, or it can be passed to another child. It could even be passed to a parent, back to a parent, uh, if they decided to get some some form of higher education in their you know later years. Uh, and then you got fees and expenses with each type of plan. What I recommend a lot with our members, my clients, is it the low cost offering with Vanguard models. Uh, through College Advantage. So retirement now, you know, starting now, obviously don't put off planning and investing for retirement. Uh, the importance of starting now, uh, the sooner you start, the longer you have for that money to accumulate. Um, and, and playing catch up can be difficult, right? Uh, I want it to be a, you know, I still want you to stay focused and try, even if you're at 50, you know, you still want to set aside money. Um, it just, you know, it, the importance of earlier is better. And in this example, you can see, so if we just took $3,000 a year, a very small amount of money, annual investment of six, or excuse me, annual return of 6% growth, um, and assuming reinvestment of all earnings and no tax. So if you start at 20, you almost have 680,000. 35, just 15 years later, 254,000, beginning at age 45, 120,000. So Again, it doesn't mean there's no hope, but the importance of starting now uh, is very important. And those are some significant differences. We're talking about, you know, almost a, a six X on the difference between somebody starting at 45 uh, and age 20, six times that amount almost. So again, try to get that and, and make that a forced saving option or forced savings option for you if possible. So uh, before you can start planning for your retirement, you're going to have to ask yourself three basic questions. You know, what kind of retirement do I, you know, do I want? Uh, when do I want to retire? And how long uh, will that retirement last? So a lot of people, obviously, there's these bullet points I'll quickly touch on. You know, we're looking at financial independence. You know, some people, when I when I do these plans, a lot want to say, hey, I want to plan for travel. That's a that's a very common uh, goal, right? The ability to live the, you know, where you want. Um, and meet those, you know, monthly expenses, uh, as well as the opportunity to provide maybe for grandchildren through legacy planning or through that college planning. Um, you know, when do you want to retire? Obviously, the earlier you retire, the less uh, time for accumulation of those dollars. Um, but, and uh, another thing that if you don't have a pension, Social Security won't start until age 62. So obviously taking that into consideration and knowing that Medicare uh, doesn't begin to 65. So, you know, self-insuring on uh, health care could be very expensive or that could be is very expensive. Um, depending on the type of plan you receive, I mean, you're looking at typically between $700 and $1,000 a month um, if you retire before 65 and, and are not on Medicare. Uh, and then how long will your retirement last? Your average life expectancy is only going to increase I mean, the uh, the chart on life expectancy since the 1900s uh, is just straight up, right? I mean, we are getting more advanced medically. Um, biotechnology is is, is phenomenal. Um, and retirements where we used to have to plan for 20 to 25 years are 
lasting 30 to 35 years. So, um, you know, I think there's a stat out there that says we have a, a near 100,000 Americans uh, that are 100 years of age today. And, in, in you know, in the world, I want to say there's over 400 that are age 110. I know it's extreme, but point being is it is happening and this movement of living longer uh, is real. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to accumulate funds for your retirement, obviously, is to take advantage of those tax advantaged retirement vehicles that I talked about. So, you know, tax deferral is a major, major asset to helping your money grow. Interest stays in, earns interest, not till it hits your pocket. Um, if you're in a traditional uh, plan, will you pay taxes? If you're a Roth, it'll be tax free. And again, take full advantage of that 401, 403, anything that is sponsored by your employer. Obviously, you've heard, you know, at least contribute the match of what your employer is going to match. Consider Roth 401k if that's an option. Yes, it doesn't go in until after taxes, but guess what? That number is going to be tax free to you at the end. And if you believe in a higher tax code, with $30 tr trillion in debt that America has, that kind of is where we are leaning towards is a higher uh, tax code. Having that money at the end, what you see in that account being yours would be a big deal. And that's tax, the advantage of tax-free of a Roth. Um, obviously, 10% additional penalty uh, for early withdrawals, uh, unless an exception uh, applies, such as a medical situation, maybe a first-time purchase of a home, uh, as well as some other options. So talking about uh, estate planning, um, and we're going to look briefly at some of the basic concepts to understand and achieve estate planning goals. Uh, we're going to look at intestacy uh, and why you might want to avoid it. We'll consider the importance of wills and trusts, um, and then uh, planning for incapacity. Right? This is um, you know maybe not being able to uh, you know, whether it's a coma, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's, not being able to perform you know, a couple of the six activities of daily living, being able to plan for that instead of putting stress on family members. So let's talk about intestacy real quick. So let's say you die leaving uh, 50,000 in a savings account, you know, where does your money go, right? So without instructions from you through a will, uh, the money will go to where your state's laws will direct it to go. So in this example, um, as you can see here, if the husband father died, the wife gets half, the two other childs or children get a quarter, no matter what um, the age is. That's a typical what uh, a typical uh, flow chart of how the money goes in most states. Um, your your wishes are irrelevant, right? So how do you avoid that? Simple, you create a will. Um, it's going to be the most important document, and we'll jump into that right into the next slide. Um, you know, it's the most vital piece of anyone's estate plan. So, uh, you know, it's a will is a legal document in which you direct how your property will be dispersed when you die. It also allows you to name an executor. So when you trust, it uh, doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an individual typically is, but uh, it can be someone like a bank uh, or a friend as well uh, who carries out your wishes, which are stated in your will. Um, in addition, your will lets you name a guardian for a minor child. If you have minor children, the importance of that is it's very important, right? On who that child, uh, you know, who cares for that child. Um, you can use your will to accomplish other estate planning goals, such as tax planning. Um, but to be valid, you, you know, your will must be in writing, signed by you, witnessed by somebody, typically through a notary. Um, and these requirements are important because if you're not careful, a will could be deemed invalid. So having an estate planning attorney, and that's something that we offer here at the credit union, in our financial mall, um, it's a free consultation. Um, and a lot of people that, you know, I've heard horror stories of a lot of the do-it-yourselfers out there. Um, but if you do, just make sure everything is buttoned up tightly because the will is gonna direct everything. Um, and then estate planning for in incapacity, all right? So finally, let's take or talk about that. You know, how do you plan for it? So incapacity describes a condition which you are legally unable to make your own decisions. It can strike anyone at any time. You know, it, you know, people have a, a brain aneurysm, a stroke. Any of these things can happen. Uh, and failing to plan means the court actually would appoint a guardian. So lack of planning increases not only the, the burden on the guardian, which is typically a family member, 
their wishes, your guardian, whether it's a child or somebody, uh, you know, a sibling, um, a parent, their decisions are not, maybe not what yours will, would want to be. So, um, you know, these situations can be avoided with proper uh, planning. Having healthcare directives uh, allow you to leave instructions about your care uh, you would want if this were to happen to you, uh, if you weren't able to express what you wanted. Um, and then it also, you know, manages the property and how uh, you can have your financial affairs taken care of in the event you become incapacitated. So, again, estate planning attorneys can set this up for you, best fit your needs with this healthcare directive. So, with that, that's the end of the presentation. I want to, one of the things I mentioned earlier, um, you know, to stay uh, along the lines of financial planning. What we here offer at the credit union is, uh, as you can see up here on the screen, it's a partnership we have uh, with Money Guide Pro. It's an advisor-based software that we use with our members, with my clients, uh, to help plan for their retirement. And uh, what it does, is it provides a clear roadmap for you, right? Something that you can follow through your whole retirement to ensure that your plan is on track. And it's especially important with, you know, some of these things that are happening today, right? We're seeing more volatility in the market. Um, we're seeing inflation. We're seeing low interest rates on, on savings accounts. Um, people are living longer. So what we do is we take a look at all your investment assets and retirement savings. We look at income, right, sources such as Social Security, uh, pension if you're lucky. Uh, then we discuss, hey, what are your, your unique goals that you want to do? Uh, in your retirement and break those down, as you can see here on the screen, into needs, needs and wants, and needs, wants, and wishes. And what we do is, just like when you go to the doctor, we're going to stress test this based on how your, your assets are allocated, what you want to accomplish, and we, we run it over a thousand different scenarios. It's called a Monte Carlo analysis. And as you can see, what we want to be, uh, you know, that arrow, we want to be in the green or the blue, right? The purple means, oh, too much uncertainty. What do we have to do to correct that uncertainty? So it's again, it's uh, we like to see that above 75% success rate. And again, it's a great tool and a guide. Um, and it's a fluid uh, plan throughout your retirement. It's gonna be, there's gonna be changes made to it because what ifs are gonna come up in each individual's life and uh, in, in individual circumstances. And uh, so it it's a really comprehensive deep dive into your unique situation, making sure that I can fund all these goals um, without running out of money. That's the number one concern people have when they come and see me is, you know, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about running out of money, right? Or a, a long-term healthcare situation, my health, where I'm in a nursing home at hundred grand a year for 10 years. Like these are common conversations that I have. And what I'm gonna encourage you, this is a free uh, member service for you guys. Uh, what I do is I send out a worksheet of items to gather, uh, as well as an overview of the software, a little bit more detailed than this one pager here. And um, you typically have people come in, it's about an hour to hour and a half, sit down and run through your scenario. When do I typically say, hey, you should have one of these in place within five years of retirement? Um, there is a more detailed video on this. If you go to our website, uh, I encourage you to jump on that under investment services. And uh, we do have a, a video on uh, about a three minute video that uh, will give you a little bit more detail as well. So uh, highly encourage it, very important, especially to today's uh, topic. Uh, with that though, I will pass it back to Kelly for uh, questions and any concerns. Perfect, thank you, Eric. As Eric mentioned, we are going to open it up to Q&A. So if you have any questions, that you thought of while Eric was going through today's content, you can go ahead and submit that using your questions feature, and I'd be happy to get that asked in our time today. Um, we do have a couple questions that were pre-submitted, so I can go ahead and start with those. The first one being, I'm interested in setting up a meeting after today's webinar. How can I do so? Okay, so that, as you can see, my, my uh, contact information up on on the screen there, I encourage a, an email. And then again, just like I talked about, I'll send you out that checklist uh, as well as uh, a few other pieces. And uh, I, I, I travel around, so I go to you know where you guys are typically banking with us, uh, you know what branch you're banking with us, um, and we'll get you scheduled. And then, like I said, that first appointment typically an hour to 
to an hour and a half. This next question is kind of along those same lines. Um, it's asking, being a GECU member, am I eligible to be set up with a financial advisor long term? Yes, absolutely. And have a long term plan uh, that you will have access to throughout your retirement, which I just highlighted in the Money Guide Pro. So yeah, short answer is yes. The next question we have is, how do I coach my college graduate who's about to embark on his first job? Do you have any advice for young people to begin financial planning? How I would coach them is if, I don't know, Kelly, if you can go back um, to that one slide, it would be the power of time value. Um, or I think you'd give a copy of these slides. That example of investing at age 20 compared to, you know, age 35 and age 45, I think that is one of the most powerful pieces uh, when I sit with younger people, uh, you know, parents that bring their children in. As a matter of fact, I had one in this weekend. I showed that. Um, it's just the importance of starting now. And it doesn't have to be the full amount. You know, you're allowed to put, in, depending on your age, you're allowed to put in a certain amount into an IRA and a certain amount into a 401k. The importance of just making sure you start because it's a forced savings. And again, having six times the money of somebody starting 20 years later or excuse me, 25 years later is, is a big deal. What happens when you start putting in more than $3,000 a year, which happens throughout your life is, you know, you're, you're making more in life. So um, that would be a, a, a great way to uh, educate them through that. And I, again, I believe you guys will have a, access to this and that's what I would highlight that page. And then this next question kind of piggybacks off that. Is there a suggested age to begin financial planning? So the financial planning with the, the, the software that I showed you typically is going to be, you know, five years out from retirement. People have a little bit better idea of assets, of what those, you know, uh, living expenses are, um, pension estimates, possibly Social Security estimates. So I typically say five years out before retirement, um, but you can certainly go 10. You know, typically I say after 50, if you're going to retire at 60, anytime then. But a rule of thumb would be five years to get one of those plans in place. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. No, you're fine. It looks like this one might be our last question. So unless any come through in the chat, we'll go ahead and end on this one. Um, for you personally, Eric, what does your relationship look like with clients um, after that initial consult? How often do you touch base or how does that structure work? Yep. So. Great question. Uh, typically, you know, how we run relationships uh, between advisor and um, member would be an annual review. Um, certainly can do semi-annuals if you want. Typically, that's, you know, too much. But some people want semi-annual, and we can do that. Uh, as term, in terms of cost, that will all be disclosed. Um, I am a fiduciary. That's uh, one of the important words you probably hear out in the financial uh, field. So, you know, your interests are always going to come before mine or before the credit unions. Um, but everything will be disclosed in terms of, you know, some things that I, uh, you know, solutions that I offer to my clients are going to have a cost. Some aren't. And being, you know, out front and disclosure is part of um, being a fiduciary. All right. Well, it looks like that is all the questions we have for today. If anyone on today's webinar has a question you think of at a later time, I'll leave Eric's contact information up on the screen for just another moment or so. If you want to jot down his email or his phone number or take a photo of it with your phone to reference later for any questions that may come up, that'll be up for just another second or two. But with that, that is all we have for today. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.